Because when you're up here, you're the, like the center of attention, and you don't realize you're focusing all that energy on me. So that's why I sit down. It makes you a smaller target, I guess. <laughs> okay. But sometimes it is uh, real confusing. You can feel the energy coming from all directions. But it's good energy. You like the conference so far? Yeah. We've had some wonderful speakers, and I'm getting a lot of very good feedback about the conference. And it's all because of you guys. Without you, there wouldn't be any conference. Okay. But um, for the last several years, I've been lecturing on the three waves of volunteers, and I'm doing that all over the world. But I'm not going to lecture on that tonight, today, today. It's not night yet, okay? Uh, because we've been covering it so much, and I even lectured on it here last year. But everywhere I go, people are saying they really identify with that that they know they're here for some reason and they don't know why. And they have this feeling, I don't want to be here, I don't like it here, I want to go home. I'm hearing that all over the world. And they said it really makes them feel good to know now they're not the only one out there that feels that way. They felt all alone and like there's something different about them. But now they say, now I know I'm here for a reason. And I know there's something more to this. So it has made a big difference, and that book has really influenced a lot of people. But it took years to get that theory together because it didn't come through just one person. I think the majority of you know that all my information I write about comes from my clients. I don't channel. I just report what the clients tell me. And you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saying the same thing, you've got a pretty good idea that it's valid because you have repeatable evidence. So it was over many years that I've come up with these different theories. And everything that's in my books has come from the clients that I work with. I consider myself the reporter, the investigator, the researcher of lost knowledge because, you know, I've been finding a lot of things that are either lost or never known or forgotten and we're bringing it all back right now. Because that's what I've been told, now is the time for all of this to return. You're living in the most ex exciting. <laughs> You're living right now in the most exciting time in history. Things are happening now that have never happened in the history of the universe. So it's a very powerful time for you to be alive. So if you don't, if you feel strange feelings, that's where it's coming from because the energy is changing so much. And we've noticed too, your psychic abilities are returning, aren't they? Like one of the speakers said yesterday, this is one of the things that are happening right now. It's being opened up again because it is time. But what I'm going to talk about this morning is, is my UFO research, and there's a lot of the things I haven't talked about in years. And I'm just going to bring up some, some of these strange things that have happened in the UFO research. And there, maybe there'll be a little time for questions anyway. But uh, I've been doing the UFO investigations and ET abductions for over 25 years. Lou Farish is the one that got me into all of this. You know, he's the one that started this conference when he asked me to be an investigator. And I had been doing past life regressions and I'd already written several books and it was like, I've not done anything to keep the person in this lifetime. But at that time, he said they couldn't find anyone who could work with these people. This is Arkansas, you know, how you, this was back, back in the early 80s. And he said, like, they would have a woman who thought she had had an abduction experience, and they brought in a psychologist, and the psychologist put her under, and he had her on board a craft, and then all of a sudden he just woke her up, which is the worst kind of therapy you can ever do, just jerk somebody out of trance. 
But he said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what questions to ask. It's not in the book. <laughs> so that's when he called me and he said, would you want to attempt this? He said, uh, you've been working in the bazaar for so long. <laughs> <coughs> we don't think this will frighten you. And I said, oh, no, it doesn't frighten me because I'm too curious. I just want to know more. <coughs> the only problem was how I had to adapt the technique. And I do use my own technique that is not like any other hypnosis technique. That's why I get so much information. But I had to adapt it to keep the person in this lifetime. So the first case I ever did was with an, a group of investigators in the Arkansas area who were having a meeting. It was 25 of them there. And they wanted, this was in MUFON was involved, and they wanted me to put this person under in front of all of these investigators. Now, that's not the best ideal situation. We didn't know her. She didn't know us. We brought her over from Oklahoma. And it's a goldfish bowl uh, atmosphere. That's what I call it. So I didn't know what was going to happen. But it worked beautifully. And it was my first t attempt at this. But after that, they didn't know it was the first time I'd tried it. <laughs> but after that, then, uh, we began getting called in on more and more cases. And that's when um, me and, and Lou and Jerry Blackburn were going out and doing some of the investigations. But after a while, it was just me and Lou. because I really needed him. He was so valuable during all that time. But I was running into things I'd never heard of. The early 80s, there was not a whole lot out yet about uh, abductions or about UFOs. And there was nobody you could really talk to about it, especially here in Arkansas. So <laughs> he was the one person I could confide in. And I trusted him implicitly because he said anything I told him would never go any further. And he's oh, I'd always honored that. So I'd call him up, and we would have hours of conversation on new theories, new things that I'd found that I didn't know what it was, talking about dimensions and like almost like time travel and all these things I was coming up with. I needed somebody to discuss it with, and Lou was always there. So that's why I miss him. He was so important in my work. So I figure he's really the reason I began all of this. So I've been doing it 25 years. Uh, the majority of my cases in the beginning are in my book called The Custodians. That's the whole thing from the beginning of my work with this all the way through until it began to get too complicated. Rather than going into UFOs, it began to go into strange metaphysical ideas and concepts I'd never heard. Then I knew it was time to stop that UFO book and start another book. And that's when I began the Convoluted Universe series. And at first I didn't know if anybody would even be interested in it. Because I said, this is for people who want their minds bent like pretzels. <laughs> it was a departure from my other books I'd been writing about reincarnation and past lives. But people jumped right in there, and they said, we may not understand it, but it makes us think. And now, over the years, we have four volumes in the Convoluted Universe series, and it keeps getting more and more complicated. At the end of Convoluted 3, I told them, and you know these are big books. They're six and having 700-page books. At the end of uh, Convoluted 3, I told him, well, now you have told me everything there is to know. <laughs> I don't think there's anything else left that you can tell me. They said, oh, no. There's more. There's a lot more. So they gave a little rest for a while, and then... I got enough material to do the convoluted four. And if you've been following them, each book gets more and more complicated. And I'm getting information now. I'm working on three more books. And each, I'm getting more and more complicated information. So 
There isn't any end to it, but you don't get it all at once. It's a gradual process or your mind couldn't handle it. What I was getting now, I could never have handled even 20 years ago. It would have been too complicated. But they say, uh, we spoon feed you. And I think it's the same with people here. You can't, we can't give you the whole loaf of bread at one time. It would be too much. It would be too overwhelming. So we give you little crumbs. They said, we give you a spoonful, digest that, and then we'll give you another spoonful. And in the beginning, it was, oh, wait a minute. What is all this? You're upsetting my whole belief system. I got it all figured out. Now you're, you're messing with all of that. But when you started looking at it, it began to make sense. So then they gave me another piece of information, another theory, another concept. So it's been growing like that. So that's where my work has come from. <laughs> but in the UFO material, I think because I had an open mind, I was curious, they were giving me a tremendous amount of information. And in my work, it comes directly from the ETs. They speak through the abduction uh, uh, person. And a lot of the other investigators don't get this information because they're working in too light of a state of trance. I work in the deepest possible level of trance. You get to that level, you get the conscious mind out of the picture, the interference. I call the conscious mind the stupidest part of the human being. It thinks it knows everything, but it doesn't know anything. But it wants to be in control all the time. I call it Mr. Stupid, you know. <laughs> but when I began doing this, uh, I get the person into this deep level. Then I found the ETs began coming through and talking to me. Okay. <laughs> because, um, but see, they have told me the ideal situation of an abduction case, and they hate that word abduction, it's visitation. The ideal situation with these cases is the person not ever remember anything because they've been coming since the beginning of time. They don't want to disrupt the person's life. So the ideal situation would be they don't remember anything. But they said they can no longer control the, um, the pollutants in the atmosphere, the um, additives in our food. If the person is on any kind of drugs, either medicinal or recreational, or they're on alcohol, this affects the chemistry of the brain. So they said if the person has an experience, they will remember it in a distorted fashion. And there's usually a lot of fear and emotion involved. But if we go into the deep level and remove that fear and emotion, we get a totally different story than what they remember. So that's why a lot of people talk about horror stories. And I said, if we do it, we, get it, we find the truth. And afterwards, a person will say, if that's what happened, I can live with that. But it's keeping him in the fear and the emotion, and other investigators, that's what they do. You're not going to get the real story. But when I began doing this, and I had the person on board the craft, and they would always be frightened, and then all of a sudden, another voice would come through. And in the beginning, this is a little, you know, disconcerting. What's this, you know? <laughs> but in the beginning, the first time it happened, I felt energy going through my body while I'm sitting next to the bed, you know, with the client. And I felt energy going through my body. And then I heard this voice, robotic voice saying, we are scanning, we are scanning. I say, okay. <laughs> then they said, she's the one, she's the one we're supposed to tell. And, you know, they said most people would be scared, but I'm thinking, okay, what's this all about? But they said, we heard, she's the one we're supposed to give the information to. Why give it to just anybody? Give it to someone who's going to do something with it. So that opened up 
a dialogue and all the hundreds of cases I had, I found how to ask them to come in and tell me what was going on and to answer the questions. So this is where we got the answer to anything anybody would want to know about UFOs because any, they're perfectly willing to give the answers. You just got to know how to ask the questions. So that's where my information has all come from with the UFOs. And I said it was gradual. Uh, but, but before we get into that, I want to explain about dimensions because this is very important in the way they operate. Now, they have touched on dimensions yesterday, but they were calling it universes. Uh, but they refer to it as dimensions. We have dimensions around us constantly. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. You can't even count them. Now, these other dimensions have be people living on them. They have cities. They're real. We can't see them because they're vibrating at a different frequency. Just like you watch a propeller blade or a fan blade, when it speeds up, it becomes invisible. But it's there. These are all living there. They're on these other dimensions. And we go back and forth between these dimensions constantly. And that's when I'm going to go into some of these stories that you may think you've had weird experiences and not know how to explain it. You've actually just stepped into another dimension for just a little bit. And I had done this on the radio shows. They said, well, can we get lost there? No, that's what George Nury asked me last week. You can't get lost because this is a natural state of the way of the physics of the Earth works. And the only way you notice you have gone over into another dimension, if something is not quite right, then you say something strange happened. But you can't get lost there because you're always going back and forth and you don't even know it. Um, and I, after I started doing this, I began to get lots of emails with fascinating stories that people were telling me when they recognized they were doing this. But some of the simple things were, they said you're walking down a street and you remember this beautiful tree that was on the corner. Well, the next time you go down the street, there's not any tree. And you say, well, that's funny. Sometimes you just think, well, maybe I didn't notice. It's kind of odd. But then the next time you go, there is a tree again. See what I mean? Some of these things, these dimensions are so similar, there will just be one little thing out of place, and you won't notice it unless you, it catches your eye like that. I had a college student that said, uh, she would walk outside of her dormitory, and they were doing construction on the street outside, and they had the yellow cones out there and the block or the, or the traffic off. The next day she walked out of the dormitory, there was no sign of any construction at all. So, you know, people just chalk it up to, well, maybe I was mistaken or something. But you see what I mean? Unless something catches your eye, you're not going to realize you are actually moving back and forth between dimensions. Uh, I had one who came to see me, and on her list of questions was a strange event that she had happened. She was in Florida, and she was out jogging in a uh, suburban neighborhood. And as she was jogging, she saw an airliner coming in so low she thought it was going to crash. She could see it between the trees. Saw the tail on it. She saw the uh, what uh, make of the airliner it was and was coming in between the trees uh, about a block or two down. And she said, oh, my gosh, a plane is crashing. So she ran all the way back to the house, turned on her TV and the radio, so there's going to be something on there about it. Nothing was ever reported. So she wanted to know what happened. So during the session, this is how we can find the answers. They said she had stepped in to another dimension where there was an airport over there. But in the dimension she normally lived in, there wasn't. See what I mean? It can be different unless you're really looking for it. And that what she saw was just a plane coming in for a landing. Those kind of things. Um, another letter I got from a man said he went out 
to watch the planes, the jets taking off at the airport. He'd like to do that. He's watching the jets take off. As they take off, they go into the sky, then they go backwards, then they go forwards, then they go backwards before they went up. And you know jets can't do that. And he saw this happen several times. Then he goes out to the street. The cars are doing the same thing. Forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. <laughs> and the only explanation I could have is that maybe he was at a juncture of the dimensions to where they were not really solid in one or the other. Well, we hear all kinds of weird stuff like this. Uh, my brother-in-law was crossing the street uh, in Kansas City, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw this car coming toward him. And he, he was so fast, he said, oh my gosh, it's going to, going to hit me. And he was bracing himself for it. The next instant, the car was on the other side of him, pulling into a, a convenience store. And he said, what happened? And he sees the guy get out of the car, didn't even look back, like he didn't even see him. And he had become invisible for just that fraction of a second to where he wasn't hit. And I've had several other people have emailed me cases like that. So something happened. And how many of you have noticed sometimes you appear to be invisible? My daughter's always got a good story with that. She said, she walked up to a, like a Starbucks and you're standing there waiting to be waited on and they don't even see you. <laughs> waiting on everybody else but you. And then she finally said, excuse me? And then it's like they were startled, like where did you come from? <laughs> this is happening more and more often because we are the dimensions are getting closer together, and you know we are moving into another dimension. So we're constantly having these strange things happen to us. But I had one case where the woman said, she lived in an apartment building. She comes down out of the apartment building to the street. She walks out on the street, and it was like it was back in the 50s. All the cars, the clothing, it was like that long ago. And she's walking down the street, and it's like she's invisible. Nobody's paying any attention to her. Because she began to get worried, because it was really like she'd gone back in time. So she began to get scared. So she got back to the apartment building. And when she went back up into the elevator, back to her apartment, everything returned to normal. It makes you wonder, what if she had not gone back up, if she'd stayed out there, would she have stayed in that time frame or what? Because these are the weird things that happen and you don't notice unless something particular like that. And I've got a lot of those stories that people have sent me. Um, but one I told on, the, on Coast to Coast last week because it dealt with the Coast to Coast show. It was back when I was doing it with Art Bell and we got, we always get tons of emails after this. We got this email from these people. There were three women, and they said they didn't like to stay up that late for the coast to coast, because you know it's very late at night. You talk most of the night. And so they had, what they had then was the long playing um, tape players. And they would record the show so they could hear it the next day. So, the one woman said the next morning she gets up to play the show. There's no Art Bell. There's a sports game on there. And she knew it was the same station because they kept giving their call letters. And there was three friends. And the second one said she got the same thing. She got the game rather than the Art Bell show. So they called the station and they said, oh, we're not uh, playing Art Bell anymore. We don't intend to do it anymore. The third woman got the show. So it existed in one of their dimensions or realities, and it wasn't existing in the other woman's realities. 
And it was a couple of weeks later, I was lecturing in Tennessee where they lived, and they all came to the lecture. And they were three elderly women. And she said, we just want to tell you this really happened, and we have the tapes to prove it. So the only thing we could think is that it existed in one but didn't exist in the others. And when I was telling that to George Norrie, he said, but now we're in all dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and she said, also, they're now carrying Art Bell again. So something, so you, may, you may think you're crazy when some of these things happen, but just remember, this is all it is. How many of you have uh, been looking for something and you can't find it? I know I put it right there. It was right there. Where did it go? Then the next day or so you go back, there it is. I usually say, guys, I need that. Will you put it back? <laughs> <laughs> but it has just gone into another dimension where that didn't exist at that time. So you're constantly moving back and forth between these dimensions, and you don't even know it. That's the interesting thing about this. But they said it's perfectly normal. There's nothing to worry about. You can't control it anyway. Like he said, you get stuck there, you know, because you're stuck here anyway. Okay, but this comes around to the UFO things. That's why I wanted you to understand about dimensions. Um, I've had, when I first began this, I had so many cases of missing time. To me, the most interesting are condensed time rather than missing time. But I'm going to be talking about both of them. See, I'm going back to the simple stuff, but a lot of you have probably never heard this anyway. We're getting more complicated material instead. I've had many cases of missing time, and these are in the book, The Custodians. One woman said she was working in an office, and she wanted to go for lunch. And the other ones in the office said, well, get us something while you're at it, and bring back lunch for everybody. So she goes out. And she drives into the downtown area. She gets out of the car. All of a sudden, there's no sound. She sees the people walking around, but she can't hear anything. And as we go further, I'll be explaining this is what they call dead sound, dead zone, twilight zone. But it gets even weirder. But she, all of a sudden, there was no sound. She's walking by the people, and it was like she was invisible. They couldn't even see her. She heard, she could see they were talking, but she couldn't hear anything. So anyway, she ended up going back to the office eventually. And she thought she'd just been gone maybe 20 minutes, half hour. She comes into the office. I mean, as she's walking up the steps to go into the office building, all of a sudden, the sound comes rushing back. And it was deafening, just like all of a sudden, all this noise comes in. And she's looking around then, and she goes up to this one man, hello, they wanted to see if he could see her. <laughs> but then she goes back to the office, and she said, I've got the lunch. And they said, we don't want it now, it's time to go home. So see, the whole afternoon had disappeared. But I did have another case that was fascinating. Uh, this woman was in Hawaii, and she wanted to go to this certain hotel that she'd never been at because she wanted to get supper and she could look out at the ocean. And so she drove around the side of the island to find this hotel. She missed the entrance. So she was driving down a little ways to find a place to turn around and go back to the hotel. And she found this uh, uh, driveway was going in where they had all these trailers and beautiful palm trees and all these flowers. It was very nice. So she was going to pull in there and turn around and go back. She pulled in to turn around and go back. And the next instant, she was on the other side of the island on a freeway headed the opposite direction, and it was night. 
So she wanted to know what happened there. Because she said when she went back later, she never could find that trailer park again. She went back many times. It wasn't there. So she said, what happened there? So during the session, I took her back to that night, and we started from the beginning of it as she pulls in. And when she pulled in to turn around, a bright light came out of the sky. And you know what, we know what that is. <laughs> and she gets out of the car, and she was taken up in the ship, and they took her to another planet. And it's quite a fascinating story. But then they brought her back, put her back her car, and, and put her on the other side of the island. And I asked them, what about that trailer park there? They said, oh, we just created that. Something beautiful and nice so she'd feel safe pulling in. You see, they can do things like that. They can create things that aren't real. They can manipulate time and space and everything. That's a lot of power to be able to do that. So she, you see, that was that case. There's so many of these. I'm trying to sort them out in my head. But they manipulate the time. This is where you get the missing time. And then they also can manipulate space. I had another woman who was driving home out here in the country on a regular two-lane highway and home from work. And she could see her house. It wasn't very far away. But as she's in a truck and as she's driving down the highway, she stops the truck because in front of her in the highway is a big white owl. And if you know, if you've been doing this long enough, you know what owls represent. See, when I started... I didn't have any of this information. I've been doing it gradually to get all of this. Now it's common knowledge. But it was a big white snow owl. In Arkansas, we don't have snow owls. They're usually in the north. But it was right there in the middle of the road. The road. So she stopped. She didn't want to hit it. And as she watched, it flew up, big wings. It flew up over the hood of her truck, over the truck, and over the back. So she turned around to see where it went. When she turned back, it was night. That quickly. So she wanted to have the session to find out what happened. So we took her through the whole thing. Naturally, you know, it wasn't an owl. It was a being standing there, and he had white robes on. And she saw it as a beautiful being, almost like a Grecian god with the features and everything. And he came over, and he put his hand like that over the truck. And that's what she saw as the bird, but he did it like that. And he was talking to her, and he explained to her even that appearance was not his real appearance. But he didn't want her to see, but he really looked like she didn't want to frighten her. But he said his craft was over behind this hill on the uh, other side of the road. He just wanted to talk to her. And you know what he did when he did that over the truck? He said he made the truck invisible so they could talk. He said, somebody comes up behind you, they will just go around the truck and not even remember doing it. They won't even see the truck sitting there. You just go around it, and they have to stand there talk, and nobody would even see it. So he was just asking her, he said, I just want to know, how do people on Earth perceive us? You know, ETs and things like that. What is their perception about it? And that was all he was talking to her about. And they had a very nice conversation. And anyway, then when it was over, he thanked her, and, and he went back to his craft, and then next thing she knew, it was dark. Because when she got home, she looked at the clock. It should have taken her not even five minutes. It was two hours later. But all they had was a nice conversation. But he was not only disguising himself as an owl, but also as this beautiful person with the Grecian features. Because they, they know how these things affect us, and they don't want to frighten us. 
They're really very gentle, very caring people. So I call these, Whitley Schriever's called them screen memories. Whenever he wrote his first books, I call them overlays. And the owls have been a big part of this. Because I had my own experience with an owl when I was doing all this investigation. And I was thinking, you think I know what it is? You think I'd be able to see what's going on? <laughs> I guess I'll tell it in here. Just It's in the books anyway. But I was coming home. I do investigations. In those days, I was out to midnight doing one after the other, going to their houses and getting all this data. And I was coming home. It was like after midnight. And I live out here on one of these mountains, dirt roads, miles between the houses. And as I came up the road and got to the edge of my land, there was this big brown owl standing in the middle of the road. And I pulled up to him, and I said, you know, well, you're pretty, you know, where'd you come from? But now this owl was so big, he was up to the head headlights. And I could see him over the hood. And, you know, and I was thinking, well, you got to move, I'm going to run over you. Yeah. <laughs> and he turned and flew, and you, his wings were huge, flew a little way in front of me, then he'd stop again, turn around and look at me. You'd think I would know, you know, but this is how normal it seemed. And I kept doing this. I wanted him to move so I could move the car and talking to it. You've got to get out of the way. And this kept up until I got to my driveway, pulling in where I live. Then it was standing right there by the driveway, and it didn't go any further. My son-in-law said that those can be dangerous because they have these big talons. But anyway, I got back in the house, and I was thinking, well, no missing time or anything. So I don't, it was just a strange experience. But later, when I was in London, uh, when I have a few days off, I like to go to museums and see things. And I think it was the Museum of Natural History in London where they have every animal in the world. It's stuffed and on display. Every animal, every bird, everything is there. So I was looking at all the birds. Their owls aren't near. I found no owl as big as that owl should have been. So that kind of thought, well, what's going on here? Because that could not have been a real owl. So I don't know what happened. But so you can have experiences you think are strange, and there might be a whole lot more to it than you think there is. OK, but let's get to condensed time. I think that is the most fascinating. Condensed time is where things happen quicker than they should have. Well, the missing time is, too. But I've had uh, cases like one in particular. The woman was working in Little Rock, and she lived, it was a good hour away uh, in the mountains. And when she left work, she knew exactly how long it was going to take her to get home, and it was midnight. And as she got onto the freeway, this is what I call twilight zone, dead zone, dead sound. I've had many cases of it when all of a sudden they report they can't hear anything. It becomes dead quiet. There are no sounds at all, no night sounds, no animals, nothing. It is dead quiet. She's driving down the freeway, a four-lane freeway, and there's no other cars, just her. And as she did, she saw this huge light in the sky, and it was like you know, big shape. It wasn't defined like a crap, but it was huge light. And it was over the trees on her right. And she's watching that as she's driving. And no sound, nothing. Everything is dead, uh, quiet. Finally, she gets to where she's going to turn off to go to the road to go to her house. As she's going up the dirt road, still looking at this huge light that's over the trees, she saw the only sign of life, if you want to call it that. In the middle of the road was a cat. And she pulled up next to it to look at it. And it's a cat sitting in the middle of the road 
on its haunches with its paws in the air. Frozen. You know, like it was getting ready to jump or something. It's sitting there frozen like that in that position, not moving. What's happening? Come on, what's happening? I just explained about dimensions and things. <laughs> it's as though she's in one dimension, that cat is in another dimension. And it's probably moving. And it's like she is moving faster, or it apparently was faster. But anyway, at that time, this light went closed just like an eye closing. Two things came down like an eyelid, and the light, the ship, whatever it was, the light was gone. She goes on home, and when she drove up, her dogs were having fits, and she said they never do that. She goes in the house and looks at the clock and found out it had only been like 10 minutes. And it should have been well over an hour. And she woke her husband up. Look at the clock. Look at the clock. Tell me what time the clock says. But this is an example of dead sound, dead zone. And I wanted to have a session with her to find out what happened that night. But she said, no, I'm a successful businesswoman. I've got my life in order. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> so that's as much as we got on that case, just that that cat was interesting. It was like frozen in time. Another case was on that same highway. Uh, but Fort Smith is down. Oh, that takes another two hours to get to Fort Smith. It's on the other side of Arkansas on that same highway. Uh, the woman was going home at night, and it always has to do with these sightings, too, at the same time. And she was getting to where she was going to pull off and go into Fort Smith, and it's a good-sized city. She saw this light in the sky, and she's watching it as she's pulling off. She pulls off to go into the city, and this is night, and she notices she's driving down the street, no sound, no people, everything is dead zone, dead sound. As she's driving down the street, she sees all of the street lights going out, one after the other, as she approaches them. And no, not, no sound of anything, people or anything. Finally, out of desperation, she pulled into a mall pulled up to a restaurant, just I want to see if there's any people around. She was getting scared. There's no cars parked outside. There's no people. It was the same way. Like she had suddenly gone into a place where there was nothing. Twilight zone. And all the whole time, this light was in the sky. So anyway, she kept going, and it was like that all the way home. The lights were going out, no people, no sounds at all, just total quiet. Then she pulls into her driveway, the light sped off, and all the sound came crashing in on her. But she was back into the normal. So when we were doing the session, I wanted to find out what was that all about, because now I'd had several cases of this with the dead sound. They said... We have to catch you off guard. And I said, why? We're not on guard. And they said, oh, yes, you are. You're on guard all the time. We have to get your attention. And they said, it, just seeing the craft is all it is. You're not abducted every time. You don't have to be. Just seeing the light, just seeing a craft Get your attention. We have to stop your world for a fraction of a second. Oh, you know, so what, do you, what happens? Why do you have to stop our world for a fraction of a second? Get your attention. Because then the information can be implanted. As long as you're on guard, we can't do it. Get your attention. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, then 
the information is downloaded on a cellular level of the brain and put into the brain. What information? What's it for? They said, it's information you will need in the future. And you'll have it when you need it, and you won't even know where it came from. And now I know it's this time we're living in right now. That your information is there, and it'll come forth when you need it. But you won't even know where you came where it came from. Because uh, a lot of people think when they have a sighting that they've been abducted. They said, that's not necessary. It doesn't have to be. Just to get your attention, that's all it is. Clever, isn't it? But I have had so many, many emails and calls of people who are getting all these symbols and um, concepts are coming at them. One man said, this is the same idea. One man said he was lying on the, his couch at night and he saw a beam of light come through the window. The beam of light came right to his forehead. And the beam of light was full of all these geometric symbols and signs. And he wanted to know what that was about. The same thing, the information is being downloaded into the brain. And he said, well, I want to know what it means. You're not supposed to know. You wouldn't understand it anyway. But it's there when you need it. And for years, I haven't been getting them lately, but I was getting people sending me symbols that they feel compelled to sit and draw. Now, Mary Rodwell is an investigator in Australia, and we're close friends, and we worked together on this kind of thing for a long time. We're getting the same stuff. I've moved in a different direction, but people will send us these things of these symbols. They feel compelled to sit there and draw. One woman in Australia said she thought her son was going crazy. He would spend there two hours drawing all of these symbols. And I had stacks of these papers, and Mary Robble has also. And um, we thought if we could get somebody, a computer program or somebody who could compare all of these, and they look similar to see if there is a similarity in there, that this is information that's being downloaded. But some people are getting it directly. Other ones feel they have to keep writing and it becomes a compulsion. Dry, draw all these symbols. Strange writings and drawings. There'll be drawings of people and they have all these little symbols in the body of the person. But she's getting the same kind of thing that I'm getting. So they said it's a downloading of information because now is the time. Now, this is going on 15, 20 years I've been getting this stuff. But see, now is the time, because they said whenever you need it, the time comes, the information will be there. And I think a lot of you are probably feeling it. All of a sudden, things are changing. Uh, we're waking up. The veil is thinning. We're waking up, and we're getting things that we would never have gotten before. Does this make sense to you? Because I get so many calls and emails, people think they're going crazy. We are not going crazy. Of course, they go to the doctor. The doctor thinks they are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Puts them on a pill or something. <laughs> but you can see why I think condensed time is, is much more fascinating when I found out what they were doing. But uh, there's no harm to you, it's just a curiosity thing. Okay, um, then we have the implants. And in the book, The Custodians, they said you must understand the implants. They're not negative at all. I know Dr. Jacobs, he keeps saying that they're, the ETs are gonna trigger the implants and turn all the people into zombies to help them take over the world. That's Dr. Jacobs' theory of what implants are. <laughs> okay. And in one of my first cases, they said, why do people always say we're here to take over the world? It's ours, it always has been. <laughs> uh, 
He said, we can't do anything as bad to you as you do to yourselves. <laughs> but the implants, I'm not going to go into the three waves of volunteers and everything, but the implants, especially up in the nasal cavities, are to track you so they know where you are. And if you're ever in any trouble, they can be there instantly to help you. Because it's all part of the grand experiment, and some of it goes on for many generations. But it's just tracking devices, and it has no harm at all. Other implants are there to keep you healthy. Because they're constantly checking, this is part of the reasons for the abductions, they're constantly checking your health. The ones in this program. Not everyone is in the program. If you read that book, you'll understand the ones that are in the program. All they are doing is keeping track of their own people. You're just souls that have come, who entered into the human body and they have to make sure you're okay. Because the energy is so different from the ET energy and the uh, human energy. And the human has no knowledge of this. They have no memory of everything that has happened. But because the energy is so different, they take them to keep adjusting the energy so you can live here. And they're also making sure you're healthy. So a lot of the implants are like time-released aspirins to dispense medication through the body to keep you healthy. And there are different parts of the body. The implants have different uh, uh, purposes. But it's not negative at all. And, uh, well, like, you know, you've heard the stories they've been talking about yesterday about collecting the sperm and the eggs and everything. See, it's just too much to go into in one lecture. If you've read my books, if you've heard my other lectures, you know they created us. And they're doing the same thing all over the universe. So what they do is collect sperm and eggs to take to these other planets and try to create other creatures that will live on those planets. And somebody yesterday made an interesting remark that backed up what I've just been finding out. They said one reason they were taking the eggs was because these other planets need this because we, they said, we have adopt, adapted right now, this time period, our eggs and sperm are different than they've ever been because we have learned to adapt to radiation, to the changes in the earth and, they are, and the DNA. All of this is a very highly developed thing. So that in the future, that's when I asked them, what are you going to do for them? And they said, we're going to need them in the future. I said, why? Because they said they won't be the same. And I think it was somebody, I don't remember which speaker it was yesterday, said the same thing, that if us in the future, our DNA has changed, and they're going to need this. So it's like storing it up for that time. But they're also taking it to other planets that are having the same problems adjusting radiation and pollutants. And they want to give them that DNA that will help those races develop a resistance to this. So everything they're doing has a very logical reason. It's just that the other investigators have used the fear and they've not got to what's really happening. I'm getting even more information on this that's going in the books I'm writing now because I keep getting more and more and more stuff. So... Uh, that's why I said, you know, I just have the curiosity. I just want to know. I want to know it all. Of course, they said, you will never know it all as long as you're alive. The human, they said, it's not the human brain, it's the mind. The mind has no concepts to really understand what it is all about. There just isn't anything. The human mind can't comprehend it. So they give us bits and pieces. And I always say, give me an analogy, give me something that I can explain, because I have to tell people these things. So we will give you an analogy, a picture, but it's not the correct one, because we can't give you 
if you can't understand it. And you never understand it all until you die, go to the spirit side, the veil is gone, and you, you get the whole picture. But I had one man at one of my classes, he said, but I want to know it all. And I said, they said, you can't. It's impossible to brain. The mind is just un incapable of really handling everything. It's, can you understand that? So we, we are getting more and more information. That's why I said they give you little spoonfuls. We're getting a lot more than we got 15, 20 years ago. We're understanding a lot more. A lot of my lectures, there's a lot of young people there, the internet generation. They're getting this because they've come into this um, world in this time with the technology and it, they understand it. But anyway, there's a whole lot more going on out here than we think there is. Okay, I'm going to go into some of the ways they've told me that they propel their craft. And I think we'll have some time for some questions then. But there's just so much. I'm just dropping you little snippets. But I'm trying to get your curiosity up. If you're like me, I want to know more and more and more. They tell me something, give me more, give me more. Okay. All right. Now... Uh, the craft, you know, there's all different kinds of craft. And, okay, I'm trying to think where to start here. Okay. The most common way that they propel their craft, they have crystals on board the craft. And I asked them one time, we were doing the very beginning of this. I was having meetings with the other investigators. Very, they're very skeptical. That's why I stopped doing it with them. They wanted to know, how do you propel the craft? What kind of fuel do you use to power the engines to get from this star to that star? That's not the way it's done. They said it's all done with the mind. The smaller craft can be controlled with one person's mind. The larger craft, it's group mind that propel the craft. They put the energy is directed into these crystals on board the craft to keep in a store of energy. And this propels the craft. And at one of these meetings, yeah, this one investigator said, oh, yeah, all you got to do is think it, and it goes. Exactly. <laughs> he couldn't get it. You, got, you don't need fuel. Now... One of the ways they travel is they go in and out of these dimensions that I was talking about. And uh, Jaime's uh, pictures he was showing is a perfect example of what they're doing. Because they, this planet is the densest, it's the most difficult planet to live on in the universe. It's the densest, the heaviest, and we're at the bottom. You can't go any lower in density energy than Earth. <laughs> I used to call us, we're the bottom feeders. <laughs> and my daughter said, don't say that. That don't sound very good. But you can't go any lower in density. So these beings come to Earth, they can't take that density. It's too much for them. So this is why they created the little greys. They are robotic beings. Now, if we think of robot, we think of mechanics. It's not. It's a biological created little robot. The, they are modeled after the seven-foot greys that are on the big uh, motherships. That's where the laboratories are. And you know, if we're going to create a robot to help us. We're going to make it look like us, aren't we? So we'll have little beings running around. But they have created these to do the work because they are not affected by the density and the heaviness of Earth. So they're the ones that come in. The other ones can't handle the density. I know some people have talked about seeing Nordics in their bedrooms, the tall blondes and things like that. Those are not real. Those are holographs, are projected from the craft. The little guys are real, but the other ones are projections because they can't handle the density. 
So, when the crafts go in and out of the atmosphere, in order to come in, they have to lower the vibration of the craft, of the ship, in order to in enter this density. So as they lower the vibration of the craft, suddenly you see a light that'll appear. And many of you have done that. All of a sudden, there's, there's a light out there. There's a ship out there. And it, where did it come from? Because they have lowered the density of the craft, and it suddenly just appears. When they get ready to leave, they raise the vibration and frequencies of the craft to go back to the other dimension. By doing that, they suddenly disappear because they're in the other um, density. I said, it's like Star Trek when they say, engage, <laughs> and they're gone. You know? That's how quick it is. Now, this is important to know because humans have to go sometimes to the craft. They try to work on you in your bed because it's easier. And then when you are taken, you're taken through the walls and the ceiling. They break down the molecular structure of the walls to get you through. And you usually have two beings accompanying the person when they do go through the walls and the ceiling. But they don't like to take you on board the craft because it affects the density, the vibration and frequency of the person. Because we are vibrating at a different frequency than that craft is, and they are. This is why they try to take away the memory. Because when they take you to the craft, they have to change your vibration and frequency just for that period of time to do what they've got to do and bring you back. They can't keep you there very long because you can't continue to vibrate at that frequency. So... I've had many, many cases where people have told me they've woken up with bruises on their body or they can't breathe when they first wake up. It's like they're paralyzed. And they say they're bruises. They said, what, did somebody take me and beat me up? No. All that happened was they said when they're doing this and they're bringing you back, just the act of breathing as you get back into our density, just the act of breathing can create bruises on the body because all the molecular structure has to be rearranged into this density. Does that make sense to you? This also explains the paralyzed feeling. They've got to get you back into this density. That's why they don't keep you any longer than that. And I've had many cases where people have talked about Behinding marks on their body, and they're usually triangle marks uh, in a you know dots. And they said all that is is some of the machinery they use to adjust your energy, adjust your health. They have to they take you on board the craft. They're using machines. They said it's okay. It goes away in a little while. It doesn't hurt you. It helps you a great deal, but it creates a mark and it does kind of frighten the person. But they said, don't worry about it. We've just helped you, and it goes away in a few days. I have a friend who is a brilliant scientist. He is, I, I keep telling him, I expect you to win the Nobel Prize. He has really, he's invented some stuff that, I'm not going to go into it too much. I don't think he wants to be identified. But he has spent his, the whole 20, 30 years I've known him working on this, and Risking, his, he had to mortgage his home and everything, but now he has invented it. It's on the market. But he emailed me, and he said, you know, I, some, I woke up, and I had these marks on my body, and he took pictures of them, and they were the triangle dots. And he said, nobody can explain what they are. And uh, he said he was worried about it. Can you tell me? I said, yes. And I said, I know you're a genius. You have these wonderful ideas. But you're getting help. They're helping you with the, the uh, theories and the ideas he came up to with this remarkable invention. And I said, this is what they do. They're just increasing your energy, checking your health. It'll go away. And he emailed me later. He said, yeah, a day or two later it was gone. But it's not anything to be afraid of. But it doesn't take away from your genius, but... You've been having help all the time you've been working on these things. 
Well, there's nothing wrong with that. This is how they get the inventions into our timeline. So if people are having these things, that's what I always tell them. They come to me scared to death having a session. They don't know what's going on with them. And I have my weekly radio show. We get these call-ins. You know, what's going on with me? They told me they are forbidden to harm a human living being. It's, they have rules and regulations that are very strict on this. There are councils over everything, councils over Earth, councils over the solar system, councils over galaxies. They have strict rules and regulations on all of this. They are forbidden to harm a human being. And also you have the laws of non-interference. So they, they've been coming since the beginning of time. And all they're doing is taking care of us. That's why my one book is called The Custodians. And the other one is The Keepers of the Garden. I said if they wanted to hurt us, they could have done it a long time ago. They have great hopes for us if we just get our act together. <laughs> they're really afraid of us because of our violence. Well, see, our violence comes from our animal nature of where we came from genetically. And that's why they said we are quarantined and isolated over here in this part of the solar system. They don't want us to contaminate the rest of the universe. <laughs> and because this is a very little planet over here and it's isolated on purpose. But they really have great hopes for us. They said if we can just get our act together, get rid of the violence and change, will be a great asset to them because of our curiosity and our creativity. So we will eventually be doing what they're doing, traveling in space and exploring and doing all many, many things. So there's a whole lot more out there than you think it is. But I just say don't paint them as negative because I know they're not. 25 years of doing these research, I've never once found a negative experience because what they think is negative can be explained. Take away the, the conscious mind, Mr. Stupid, and get to what's really going on, and they're amazed. I've worked with cases that other investigators have also had done first, and it was all fear-based and horror. And I've done the same client, and we get a totally different story. So that shows you it's the investigator has a lot to do with it. But mine have always been positive, and they explain every single thing you would want to know. I might throw in here two of the cattle mutilations. They said, well, they're very concerned with the increase in cancer and other diseases in the human being especially the, at the pollutants, what they're causing. This is one of the things they're trying to find out how the cures for that. And they are developing cures for the different diseases because we were created to live forever and never get sick. They want us to get to, back to that point we were supposed to be. And it was spoiled because of a meteorite that hit the earth during the development stages, and it brought disease for the first time, and it ruined the experiment. So they've been trying to get us back to that stage ever since by the, they're trying to get the, cure the cures for the diseases. Let's see, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So anyway, they said if they're so interested in what, how the body is adapting to the pollutants in the air, the additives in the food, they're also interested in what we eat, what we are consuming. So they said the cattle mutilations are just to check our food supply. What's in that? What are we putting into our bodies? He said they're also checking the plants, but they said people don't notice that with the crops. But that's all it is, just to check our food supply. It all makes sense whenever you really ask the questions and get down to the bottom line anyway. Okay, I think uh, we've got about 15 minutes. I can go to some questions. Uh, Julia, are you back there? 
Test. Test. Oh, yeah, turn on the lights so we can see. Do you have a microphone over here? Okay. We've got about 15 minutes, and then we'll have the panel. And I want you to focus the panel. Mic test. Here we go. If you have a question, please come over to the podium, and we'll get you set up where you can ask Dolores the question. I think Julie will be coming down here in a minute. Uh, until then, just come on over, and we'll start the questions with you, Dolores, as soon as okay, you're ready. Sometimes I can't understand them. That's why I wanted her up here. But... Um, I know I've been giving you little bits and pieces, but maybe it was just little curiosity things for you to, to learn from anyway. Keep an open mind. You ready for okay. okay. Go ahead. You said that they were concerned about humans getting more disease, more cancer. My question is about Monsanto, the GMOs, and our food supply, how it's being destroyed. And what they have to say about that, why is there no interference? Why are laws getting passed to help those corporations right now? I didn't get the whole question, except about eight. Okay, uh, her question was, the, the, all the additives they're putting in our food, a lot of the GMOs uh, from yeah. Monsanto Corporation and some of those, why are they being allowed to do that and laws being passed that allow them to do that? Well, remember, we were created. They said, give this beautiful planet a creature with intelligence and free will and see what he does with it. But aren't the drugs and So they have free will, and we also have free will, whether we're going to eat that or learn to do be differently. But the ones who are doing it have free will to, to do it, unless we find out. And that's where we're finding out now. We can make changes ourselves. And that would be the same with the drugs and pharmaceuticals. It's yeah. Our, it's human choice as to where it's we It's human choice to. because that's one of their main directives is the Star Trek directive, not interference. It's real. Star Trek is real. So they said once you have created a civilization, you cannot interfere with the development of that civilization. You just got to stand back and shake your heads. What are these kids doing? Because, <laughs> okay. We have free will to do whatever we want, and they can't stop us unless we're going to blow the planet up. Okay. I have a question about something altogether different. Um, about what? Altogether different. I, I, you want me to speak up louder? Oh, I can speak real loud. When, um, when I was 10 years old, I had an experience that actually happened in a church. I was raised Pentecostal, and um, I, um, they call it been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I started speaking another language. And uh, since then, that's I, not ETs. That's not ETs. No, that's past life memories. Okay, so that's what, where the language comes from. It's a language you spoke in another la other life. Well, there's many. There's many languages. It's yeah, have, but I didn't get them till I asked for them. I want diverse tongues, and I got them. And that's all past lives? It's coming from the memories that are already in your mind of where you other lifetimes. I've had people do this during the session, start speaking in unknown tongues. And I have recordings of them. And I've taken them all over the world, and people can't identify them because they're so old that they're not spoken anymore. But, you know, when you're in an experience like that, it's like going into a trance when you're like you're talking about when you're in the church. You are in a light trance because no, no, I'm not in a trance because I'm very aware, and I found that out years ago when I was, I call this praying. I was doing this, and while I was speaking in these tongues, I was thinking, what am I going to make for dinner? Yeah. So it's but you're it's in not, a you're in a light state of trance. Okay. That's the same as meditation. Okay. So you're able to tap in that memory, especially look at the surroundings, look at the energy of the church, what it was doing. It was creating a way to do it. It's nothing wrong with it. It's nothing to be afraid of. I'm not afraid of it. You just I mean, opened up some memories there. I'm not afraid of it. I just need to understand where you're coming from mm -hmm. and that. Other lives, the languages you spoke in other lifetimes. Okay, I have one more quick one. Okay. My daughter told me that her son is not her husband's. And I asked her who the father was, and she said, 
they implanted sperm in her husband's because he didn't have a sperm count. The aliens. Possible. And I said, uh, no. So now I'm beginning to think she's not just nuts, she's telling me the truth. <laughs> Okay, that's all I got. It's possible. <laughs> There's stranger things out there than you can imagine. <laughs> okay. That's why nothing surprises me anymore. Okay. So it sounds like from your perspective, all ETs are benign. What about the reptilians? They're, they're really are. They're benign also. Uh, We're afraid of them because look at our history of being afraid of reptiles even going back to Adam and Eve, and we were always afraid of snakes. That's an ingrained fear in us. They're just another being. That's all they are. They've told me, you'd be surprised what you could have looked like. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on the, uh, the primeval soup when they create the chemicals in the planet, in the air. It's, that's what creates what we look like, the cells. And we developed along the mammal line. Other creatures develop along the insectoid line. Other ones develop along the reptilian line. I've had cases when there have been combinations of a lot of them. Also, combat of people you wouldn't even think could possibly be alive. Creatures that look like triangles, balls on top of balls. And there are all kinds of mixtures. Oh, that you wouldn't even possibly think of. It just depends on the primeval soup that the uh, cells, the being is developed in. Reptilians are just another being. That's all they are. You just have to understand where they're coming from. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a couple questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, we live here. We actually live on the river about 15 minutes from here. And I continuously see giant white balls of light. It's like a giant star. And I see them. Like they were showing? Oh, yeah. like the, And they'll come down really low. And I'm, I know I'm not crazy. My husband has seen them twice, too. My family thinks I'm crazy. But um, <laughs> I want to know why I keep seeing these giant white stars, and my other question is, um, I'm very into prayer and divine love and meditation, and yeah. whenever I'm in my prayer state, or whenever I go to bed in the evening, I'm able to see all of these things that are happening, and treatments, and like beings that are like light, like their bodies, but they're light, and they're very nice, and, yeah. and I always have electric blue energy i see it all the time okay and white little flashes of light so mm -hmm. please tell me i'm not crazy you're not crazy <laughs> if you are then most of the people i see are crazy then i <laughs> you know you have a guardian angel don't you yeah i believe i work with the angel you call him a guardian angel or a guide Everyone has one that is a, at least one that's assigned to you when you're born. It's with you your whole entire lifetime. And many times when you're in that sleep state, you may see them. And they appear as glowing energy. Well, not necessarily ETs, it's just your own guardian angel. Also, you probably don't know, but every night when you go to sleep, you go out of your body. Everybody does. You, the soul is the real you. The body is just your vehicle. The body's what has to rest. The soul never does. So while the body is sleeping, you get awful bored sitting around waiting for it to wake up. <laughs> so you can get on with your business. So when the body goes to sleep, you're out of there. And you're going all over the planet. You're going to back to the spirit side. You're going to other planets, other dimensions. But when you go, you always have your guardian go with you to make sure you get back. You're attached with the silver cord at all times so you can't get lost. And in the morning, you're kind of reeled in back to the body. So when you're in that state, when you're just beginning to leave the body, you will see the other beings in the room. And you don't usually know you're traveling unless you have dreams of uh, flying, 
are being in strange places that you don't know about. Some people have learned to remember, but everybody does this. You can't control it. And is it normal to see, obviously, uh, all of the shapes and the different, I hear a lot of different sounds and harmonics and shapes and colors, like frequencies. All of this happens, and I'm just like, okay, what's going on? You're here? awake or asleep? I'm awake. As we were talking about, things are changing. The veil is thinning. We're beginning to see through the dimensions. Well, that makes me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's enjoy it. <laughs> just, just realize you're developing, you're changing, which is good. Okay. Hi, good morning. Uh, I was wondering, in your experience, a lot of our conversation revolves around the you know, technological things. Things like aesthetics, like beauty, artistic expression, like music, poetry, dance. Is this something that's more universal, or is this very peculiar to human I beings? didn't get what that part was. It's my daughter there. She translates for me. All right. well, when we're in other countries, I, especially England, I can't even understand English. I'll try. <laughs> but, so. Okay, he's talking about a lot of times the languages, they're saying they're technical, but he's wondering if uh, art and music and dance and beauty, things like this, are just for earth or this plane or are they may be another form of that's the real is it more universal is it more, that's is what it it's universal? really so. that's what it's really all about the music and the beauty that's what it is and they so they said it's it's really all about love and beauty and uh the music all of that is is what we need that really helps the soul and Especially when you get on the spirit side, the, the music and everything is beautiful over there. But that is, it's, it's what we need. We need that. It's where we're, they always keep saying, bring joy into your life. Stop and smell the roses. Have fun. And so, <laughs> so I hope you're having fun here. Okay. But no, that's a beautiful state. Enjoy it. Okay. Yeah, what, I, what I heard, these are expressions of love, and that's what the universe is. So, yes. Can she describe mm -hmm. anything she's experienced? Now, I don't know about this heavy rock music. I don't know about that. <laughs> that has a different vibration. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Uh, Super Jen, Indigo Spirit of 31 years here. Dolores, it sounds like you're talking about going into other dimensions is like fluky or accidental. It so, happens all the time. You can't control it. Well, I would like to share with you what I do and I and and ask you if you if that is consciously going into another dimension. Some um, people have learned to control it. Yeah. Well, I do not lock my vehicle or bicycle and I think that I'd like to live in a world where I could go to the grocery store and no one steals my bike. I don't lock mine. Am I putting my bike nobody in Nobody in dimension? our whole town does. We live in a town where nobody has to worry about that. But is, is that putting my bike in another dimension where bike thieves just won't see it? You know? Oh, yes. You, don't you know how to make your, your vehicle invisible? <laughs> you haven't learned how to do that yet. That's what she's doing. Okay. Yeah. You put a shield around it, you, nobody can see it. Well, you put it around your house, burglars right. and thieves can't get in. Yeah, you learn to do this with your mind. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it's normal. <laughs> Is that a mind power thing or a dimension shifty thing? You know. Well, it's like I said a while ago. People are becoming invisible. Uh, it's just a. You put the protection around it and ask it to become invisible. They won't see it. Look at the stories I was telling about where people couldn't see these people. Yeah, Jill, you have an answer there? Well, your statement was, I want to believe that I live in a world that does this. So her intent is to have this world where her bike is safe, her car is safe. So what did she create? Her, her world. world. Yes. <laughs> Look how powerful your mind is. 
So Dolores, my question is about all the prophecies that have been available. I started reading Edgar Casey in 65, 66 and memorized and prepared and uh, traveled all over the world in preparation and the things did not happen. So what I'm wondering is do we have people from uh, the future that have come to intervene so that most of the prophecies have No, it's happened. not like that at all. Okay. Okay, now we only can have a few more questions because we're going to run out of time. Oh. Okay, but no, it's not like that at all. There are many dimensions, remember? In all of these dimensions in parallel universes and parallel lifetime, you have different possibilities and probabilities. That's why it's so difficult to predict the future because it can go off in many different directions depending upon what you do in your own life. Your decisions determine what your life is going to be like, what your future is going to be like. And I was lecturing on this for 20 years when I wrote my first books on, on the prophecies. And they said there are nexus points where something has to happen. But then from there, time breaks out into all of these branches of all the possibilities and probabilities of what can happen from that one action. And they can be from the worst to the least. And so you choose your future prediction or future life by which one of these paths you want to go on. So there's many there. It doesn't have to be intervened. They're all there. They're all possibilities. Which one do you want to have be your future? You control that. And some of the prophecies don't come true because we took a different timeline. Thank you. Okay. Okay, what... This will be the last one then. I'm sorry. Because we gotta got to get set up for the panel. Yeah? From your Nostradamus books, the Antichrist, is he active now? See, that's what I'm talking about, turning down a different timeline. We're that's what he wanted us to do. He said, if I tell you the most horrible things you can do to yourself, will you do something to change it? And so, he wanted us to go down a different timeline. We have done it. Yay. We were supposed to have already been in a horrible war by the year 2000. We had wars, but not what he saw. So we have been able to change the future, and now we're in the time of the great genius with all the wonderful inventions. So we did, we did change the future.